Glory to Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, amen. So let's pray our prayer to the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit and they shall be created and you shall renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O God, who instructed the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift of the same Spirit, we may be always truly wise and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The eighth beatitude, we're on, we're in our spiritual book club meeting here, and we're on the eighth beatitude, and Father Jacques Philippe's book, The Eight Doors of the Kingdom, Meditations on the Beatitudes, and that's from Scepter Press, 9 to 20, 18. No, we're on page 195. Happy are those persecuted for justice. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. For one is approved if, mindful of God, he endures pain while suffering unjustly. That's the first quotation was from 1 Peter 414 and the second first Peter 219 and this but even if you do suffer for righteousness sake you will be blessed have no fear of them nor be troubled first Peter 314 the disciple and the master the last two beatitudes the eighth and the ninth have the same subject persecution for justice eight is the number of the resurrection the eschatological advent of the kingdom. So eight, the eighth day, so there are seven days, right? So the Sunday, the first day of the week becomes the eighth day. And uh, the symbol of eternity there. And also, it's interesting, the Beatitudes, there are eight Beatitudes. And the Church of the Beatitudes is an octagon, if you go to the Israel there on the Lake of Galilee. And eschatological means about the end things. Death, judgment, heaven, and hell, basically. The eschatological advent of the kingdom. But this is an advent, meaning coming, that takes place through patient nurture and the sorrows of labor of which the number nine is a symbol. Oh, I didn't know that. Nine is a symbol of labor and uh, patience. The sorrows of labor. So I wonder what that uh, numerology system that comes from. Well, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely. On that account, note falsely. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. Matthew 5, 10 to 12. Lest there be any doubt, the reference to persecution on my account makes it clear that this is persecution for Christ. So there are people who, that are, uh, who suffer because they're obnoxious. And then and they, they often, uh, they may be you know, fanatically devoted to Christianity in their view of what it is. Uh, but often the, the, these people are nasty and the, the like. And then they're... Uh, uh, they are given reproach for their nastiness. They say, oh, I'm persecuted. I'm persecuted for Jesus' sake. Uh, the, the thing is, they often do the opposite. They're often people who are uh, anti-evangelists in the sense of bringing, proclaiming the good news in, in their bitterness and in their uh, often self-righteousness. 
But the irony often that you get often these people who uh, you know claim that uh, the people outside their particular group are uh, are uh, proclaiming works righteousness that you uh, earn your way in and all this stuff. But often the, 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 those people who are doing it are uh, seem to be the height of self righteousness, and they'll. Uh, condemn the Pharisees, because not knowing Pharisee theology at all, uh, and generalize. And, uh, but the thing is, Jesus may well have something to say to them. So there's a Greek proverb that says, remember, with every finger pointed out, there are three pointed back at you. So we always have to begin with our assessments and taking an inventory, a moral inventory, we have to begin with ourselves. Because ultimately we can't do that for others. We can, we need to assess their actions and stay away from them if need be. Uh, and uh, see if the actions are in accord with, with authentic faith, hope, and love. But we leave the con condemning or the sanctifying up to God. The church has never said, so-and-so's in hell. You know, I had a friend who was a fundamentalist. And, and he said, oh, well, well uh, there are many people in hell. Most people are in hell. That was his saying. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, oh, Jesus said that uh, many are called and few are chosen. And they, the road is narrow to, to heaven, but the road to hell is wide. I said, well, the, because the road is wide doesn't mean that everybody's going down there. Or whether we can even assess that. We have to make sure, I have to make sure that I am not going down that road. So uh, when we do need to proclaim the truth and warn people about going down the wide road to hell. And as, it's, as we're uh, cajoled into that by uh, the culture of death uh, or, or all sorts of things. Uh, greed in all its forms, which often loves to disguise itself as I'm just doing this for the benefit of the human race. Or uh, this is for the glory of God. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we should uh, expect opposition and indeed persecution from the world. And, and it's certainly true today. We're living in the great age of martyrs, this century or this century and a half, even. Uh, has been the great age of martyrs, far greater than the, the age we think of the age of martyrs under the Romans in the uh, before Constantine, or under the Sasanians or anywhere. This is this is the great age of martyrs that we're under now, and we should not make it. Uh, we should not give fuel to the fire by uh, spiritual laziness, let alone by uh, the scandal of doing evil and trying to cover it up, sadly, which many have done. No, we have to be open in our repentance and we have to uh, always point to Christ rather than to ourselves. The righteousness or justice envisioned is the justice of which we spoke in reflecting on the fourth beatitude. This is something far larger than justice in human relationship. It is the truth and faithfulness of God considered in relationship to humanity's salvation. Yes, it does involve justice in human relationship. But this is greater than that. This is pointing to the very righteousness of God, the very justice of God, which transforms, which heals, and which gives us the ability to affect justice in human relationships and justice in our own relationship with God and our own relationship within ourselves even. This is something far larger than justice in human relationships. It is the truth and faithfulness of God 
considered in relation to human humanity's salvation. So always to, to look in the light of that. So we need to be very concerned about bread and butter issues for ourselves and, and for the world, especially those who are oppressed, uh, who are impoverished through no fault of their own, and, and people who are uh, suffering in the great in inequities of this world. Yet that should not take the whole thing, the whole attention. We have to proclaim a spiritual union with God. We have to proclaim uh, living a full life in this. So we, you cannot be truly spiritual if you're not concerned about uh, the suffering of other people. That's a, that's a delusion and a, a scandal. But the same is true, one cannot be truly spiritual if one isn't interested in the spiritual welfare of others, in, in the moral welfare of others, as well as in the physical welfare of others. It's all one thing. As the last beatitude, the conclusion, this one has specific significance. As is also true of the first beatitude, this one promises us as its reward the possession of the kingdom, God's love fully reigning in our lives and also beyond. This life isn't all. It's beyond that, and we are called to participate in that. Here it is repeated a second time and addressed more directly than before to the disciples and the others who hear Jesus. Happy are you. Here, pushed to its extreme, is the paradox of the Beatitudes. Happiness, indeed, the urging to rejoice and be glad, lies at the heart of that humanly least gratifying of situations, the experience, experience of persecution, insult, and infamous slander. This is the culmination of the way mapped out by the Beatitudes, the summit of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives strength to embrace suffering for Christ as a good thing, to welcome the cross as a gift. And we should really pray for that, that grace, to welcome everything as gift, that God is going to use everything. And, and the cross, uh, our own cross, our cross with a capital C, whatever that is, the whatever sufferings come in striving to live faith, hope, and love, like a the sufferings that come in just existing, all of these things, to see that as a gift, which is very difficult and a very counterintuitive. But uh, it, the more we do that, the more we experience this peace that surpasses understanding. Because then nothing can take the peace away. We can have sorrow, we'll have sorrow with other, you know, other people's uh, sorrows as well as our own, and, it's, and especially you know, when people we love and all that seem really to be going off the edge, whatever edge it is. And uh, so uh, that we would know the fact: happy are those who are sorrowing, blessed are those who are sorrowing. When we're sorrowing for the sake of our sins and repentance. We're uh, sorrowing for the sake of other people's sins, and we're sorrowing for the suffering of other people. Well, the su su whether suffering in body, mind, or spirit, as well as our own. Because if we uh, don't empathize with ourselves, we won't be able to empathize with anybody else in the long run. This is the culmination of the way mapped out by the Beatitudes, the summit of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives, strength to embrace suffering for Christ as a good thing, to welcome the cross as a gift. 
Here is the ultimate degree of maturity and spiritual freedom, as well as the most powerful witness human beings can give. And it's something that even when we feel we've arrived, we're actually arriving, and that it's, there's still more to go. And then the power of that freedom is, is so wonderful. If you look at uh, uh, an example I could use is Blessed Titus uh, Bransma, who was a Carmelite uh, priest, Carmelite friar, who uh, would not give in to the Nazis. He was Dutch, and uh, he was involved in, in Catholic uh, publishing there, Catholic media, as we call it today. And uh, he condemned the racism of the Nazis. He condemned of what they were doing to the Jews and all this stuff. And, uh, he knew this would get him in trouble. He had been doing this before, before the Nazis rolled in into the Netherlands, but he continued doing it. And then uh, they, he was told if he didn't stop, that he would be taken away. And they did, they took him away. And he died in uh, a concentration camp. Uh, and But uh, people who survived the concentration camp in World War II said he often had joy in the midst of this. Uncle Titus there, the, who was, uh, and uh, in the midst of this, because he had really let go of everything. And uh, he was focused at this point on, on the reality of heaven. And so we uh, need to focus on the reality of heaven without giving up our duty here, as he did. You know, he he was not going to be silent about uh, the wickedness, uh, uh, the murderous wickedness of, of, of the Nazi systems. And uh, so, and he died for that. He was martyred for that. Titus Brands but pray for us. The church has always known persecution. Sadly, church people have whenever they get the opportunity and power, have often done the same. They've persecuted. So I was listening to uh, uh, some lectures by Dr. Uh, uh, Teofilo Ruiz, uh, a, a Cuban-American uh, historian, and on, uh, especially on Spain and Spanish America on uh, this thing, the, uh, the other 1492 was the name of it. So it was uh, everything that was going on, the, the persecution of the Jews, the, uh, the persecution of Catholic Jews also, uh, the racism and all the things that was involved at the time, uh, done in the name of the church, done with the, the even often with the blessing of church leaders uh, and all that. And, uh, uh, and uh, how that was, uh, we who should be the first to empathize with people who are persecuted should be the last to persecute people because of what they are. Now, of course, uh, we have to, some people try to use this as a sort of, uh, that everything is permissible, that's not, that's not the case, or that we should not speak up uh, in the in the area of, of personal uh, responsibility and, and by just personal importance of obeying the commandments of God. We have to. We have to speak up in that. And we can be intimidated by our culture, and this has been true always. And sadly, often church leaders have been very intimidated often by uh, those in power not to do that, that who've been sucked in. And sometimes... They were the people who were, were doing this. They were so invested in, in, in worldly power and worldly wealth and in all this that they were not going to shake the system at all. They were just going to bless the system. So often that uh, uh, the, the, they would not advocate reform. And sometimes we get examples like Rodrigo Borgia, Alexander VI. Uh, not only was he not calling forth for reform and, and, and applying it in his own life. His, his life was uh, a, quite a scandal and stuff like that. 
The church has always known persecution, but today it is more prevalent than ever before. And that's true. The century ex extending from the Armenian Genocide at the uh, end of World War I to the executions carried out by the Islamic State, the ISIS, the so-called Islamic State, has witnessed more victims among the Christian faithful than the 20 previous centuries. And among all Christian martyrs, that's worth repeating, the century extending from the Armenian Genocide to the executions carried out by the Islamic State has witnessed more victims among the Christian faithful than the 20 previous centuries and among all Christian martyrs. An ecumenism of blood is among the marks of the church today. And so, but also, there's also a, a great uh, rise in uh, sectarian fanaticism of, among Christians, also at the same time. But uh, there is this ecumenism of blood. And again, in the concentration camps and prisons under the Nazis, and also under the communists, uh, in the days before the Catholic Church was involved in ecumenism, in fact, when the uh, leaders of the church were condemning it, that when they were in these situations, they saw the way of God. And not just ecumenism, really interfaith. Thing. They saw uh, God working in so many other people. God was merciful in all of these things. And ecumenism of blood is among the marks of the church today. So often, the, you know, when, they, uh, when there are attacks against Christians, they don't ask, uh, oh, is this Catholic? Uh, among you know the many of these extreme uh, groups, or you know, is this you know Methodist or whatever? They just this is Christian and has to be destroyed. Although we see now in Canada, they seem to be taking a particular thing for uh, Catholic churches. That I haven't heard of any uh, Anglican churches or Protestant churches uh, in which uh, which were also involved in the uh, the. Uh, school system by which uh, Native American people, uh, First Nation people, as they're called in Canada, often, were taken away to be decultured uh, from uh, their culture and made so that they could be assimilated. And there were abuses, uh, many abuses in that. Uh, but it's the Catholic churches that were the, uh, the Antifa fascists are burning down. And that's what it seems to be. It doesn't seem to be Native American, it seems to be. Uh, it's, uh, and I'll put that in quotes because uh, they're probably not people who necessarily belong openly to such a you know, such a movement. But anyway, maybe they do. So we're seeing that. So uh, let's not kid ourselves about that we can just, if we just keep our heads low, that uh, persecution will not come knocking at our door. If we don't speak up about the persecution of others, including but not just Christians, but uh, the persecution of the Uyghur Muslims in uh, in Western China and other places, or what's going on. If we keep silent, uh, uh, you know, it's the, the, there's a poem that said, you know, they came for the uh, for the Jews, but I wasn't a Jew, so I didn't do anything. They came for the uh, you just named the buried groups uh, that that the poet didn't belong to. And then at the end he said, and then they came for me and there was no one to do anything because uh, you know, I had uh, done nothing. And you know, if everyone does nothing, then evil is victorious in this world because it won't be victorious forever. That's, you know, we've read the end of the book. We know that uh, virtue triumphs that God triumphs, that love triumphs. Persecution can take various forms. The shedding of martyrs' blood, social discrimination and restriction, hateful characters of the Christian faith in the media. So that's, that's you know, mild there. That's a mild uh, thing. But it, 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 persecutions, you know, they don't drag you off to the uh, to the gas chambers out of the blue. This is all built up. 
because they did that. They, 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 so we can't tolerate this. This is uh, for others as well, because there's a, a great rise in anti-Semitism and Jew hate. Now we cannot sit by silently about that, because we're all in this together. Hateful characters of Christian faith in the media, especially Catholic. The exclusion of religion from the public square. This doesn't mean, you know, quote unquote, in Poland's in the cinema. This is just doing this publicly, you know. Sneers by teachers and schoolmates aimed at a teenager who affirms that he or she is a Christian. Understand misunderstandings and conflicts within families when some member or members attempt to live the Christian vocation and much else. So expect that. So the, expect the sneers, get, get used to the sneers, and don't let that uh, put you down. But we should not respond in kind, which is the temptation. But, you know, try to do, try to do it calmly and uh, adamantly. But there are times in which you have to really be a strong in voice as well, it's true. So, often too, especially in Western countries, we see at work very insidious forms of persecution involving not open persecution, but the defaming and denying of Christian values. To be sure, we must avoid having a persecution complex and retreating into a sort of ghetto for protection against the modern world, although I think we do need to stick together and we need to cultivate a Christian culture uh, and, and our relationships and that, because often when we're saying, well, you can only come into this unless you give up this or tolerate this or that or the other thing, which we find, you know, not, you can only come into this if you accept pornography, for example. We have to stay out of it. So we need, you know, when it comes to media, we need cultivation more and more of Christian media, real Christian media, not uh, superficial or not um, one that has the, the name Christian, but often is filled with hatred and, and the like. Uh, no, real Christian media, real thing that shows forth authentic faith, hope, and love. And also things that, we, uh, that just for fellowship, to not to be excluded, you know, that, so we can at least uh, act with one another. But that said, it's simply a fact that living in conformity with gospel values and the teaching of the church isn't easy today. Parents are all too aware of this when they are forced to confront the conflict between the worldview and the values they try to transmit to their children and those on offer at school and in the media. Jesus clearly announced, before all this, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues, or I think better yet to say the meeting places, and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors for my sake. This will be a time for you to bear testimony. Not a time for capitulation, but a time of bearing testimony. Yes, we have to be prudent, you know, speak when we can speak, and, uh, but not to be cowed into silence or in, into capitulation in, in active cooperation with evil. And he said, there should be no surprise about this. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. John 15, 20. In fact, and alarmingly timely now, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. So that was John 15, 20 and John 16, 2. So it's, it's quite timely now. So the ISIS and those things, they're all they're doing this in the name of God. Uh, they have uh, persecution and uh, murders and uh, all sorts of horrible things done in the name of God. 
so the continuity with the old covenant. Like the other Beatitudes, the eighth is rooted in the old covenant. But, uh, uh, the covenants are things the Lord fulfills. He doesn't abolish them. It's, they're reformed, and they're, the barbarisms are cast out. Uh, and often things are uh, reinterpreted in a new light, in the light of grace, in the light of faith, hope, and love, in the light of natural law, etc. But uh, they're not abolished. Is God doesn't say, well, okay, this is the way for you to, oh, okay, now uh, you have to throw all that out and have nothing to do with it. No, that wouldn't be the way it is. The reality of persecution is found in different forms. The figure of the just man persecuted because he is faithful to living and announcing the word of God. The prophet Jeremiah is a good example. The people of God who suffer for being different, persecutions, to which Israel was subject as an exodus, the, and, the, and also the book of Esther, or the books of the martyrs of Israel, such as the, the book of uh, the Maccabees, the books of Maccabees. Here we notice a characteristic of persecution. It is hostility that does not have its ultimate source in historic, social, political, or other such causes, but ultimately in hatred of God. Now, of course, that's always there. The, the social, the political, the economic are always involved in persecution. There's a look at that. Uh, the, someone I knew of was saying, oh, the martyrs in England under Elizabeth and James and all those, uh, they're not real martyrs. That was all political. So they were often, often when the priests were often caught, they, uh, often very good livings if they would renounce this. So renounce uh, ministering uh, to the Catholic people, renounce their Catholic priesthood. And, uh, and, they, and if they didn't, then they were killed often in ghastly ways, being drawn and quartered, uh, being butchered alive. Uh, that was a way, uh, uh, that was a common thing. So, you know, if you had your choice between being burnt at the stake and that, um, it would be a hard choice. I don't think that they're both ghastly. But uh, so hatred of God, isn't it? Uh, and an attempt by the adversary to destroy God's plan by attacking his children, or even better, corrupting his children, and getting his children to do this, to do the devil's dirty work. And especially if they do it in the name of God, then... Uh, uh, that fills the devil with glee. It's a, he's, uh, it's a win, 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 win situation for the devil in that, in that case. Quoting a psalm, Jesus says, He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. It is to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. John 15, 23 through 25. The result is not just a record of human misfortunes, but a manifestation of a ferocious struggle between the mystery of evil with a capital E and God's providential plan. The demon opposes the election of Israel and the founding of the church, as he does all other expressions of divine mercy that work to accomplish salvation. Hatred of Israel, like hatred of Christians, has some human explanations, but those fail to account for it. Its deepest roots are in the spiritual realm, in hostility towards God and his creative and redeeming work. This hostility is described early in the psalm. The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and his anointed. Psalm 2, 2. And there's a footnote here. In modern times, the rejection of God has turned against such fundamental elements of God's creation as the distinction between the two sexes, male and female, and the family. There is an impetus in the direction of a version of humanity severed from the plan of God. 
So, uh, but again, there have been persecution in the past, done in the name of the church, of people, um, same-sex activities, and often winking at heterosexuals doing the same thing, but then sometimes uh, torturing these people to death. And uh, so that doesn't say, oh, well, then we just, you know, condone everything. That's not the way. But we are not to go to the way of uh, a persecuting mentality uh, of that for uh, those who disagree with us. Uh, but we have to stand up for our right not to be uh, browbeaten, not to be uh, caught up. Because how often in history the persecuted then become the vindictive persecutors. Uh, how often we have seen that. Acts record that during one of the first persecutions, a psalm of trust in God was recited. The place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. Whoa. Acts 4.31 The Holy Spirit came to the aid of those suffering for the kingdom. In the Old Testament, the figure of the prophet, or just man, who was persecuted, becoming an object of hostility and hatred by all because he belongs to God and proclaims God's word. So we think in the book of Revelation, the true prophets. So they're not only uh, persecuted and killed, but uh, their killing was uh, an occasion of celebration of gift giving. In the Old Testament, the figure of the prophet or the just man who was persecuted, becoming an object of hostility and hatred by all, because he belongs to God, and proclaims God's word, the word which is often uncomfortable, especially to the powerful, finds its deepest expression in the passages in Isaiah that concern the servant with a capital S. So we see this as Christians reading this, the suffering servant things as fulfilled in Jesus, and often starkly fulfilled in Jesus. This servant signifies both a people and an individual. I, this is Isaiah 53 uh, we're talking about. This servant signifies both a people and an individual, and brings an extraordinary message of hope. The suffering of the just will be the source of holiness for all, including those who so frantically oppose him. He makes himself an offering for sin. He shall bear their iniquities. Isaiah 53, 10 and 11. The prophet Zechariah says the death of the just opens up a source of grace and conversion. On that day, there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. Zechariah 13.1. The suffering of the just, culminating in Jesus' cross, is a scandal. But it is a mysterious part of the history of salvation and God's plan. It is both judgment and salvation, a highlighting of human sin and a source of healing from sin. So we'll stop there on page 202 of the grace of suffering for Christ next time. So let's pray the Our Father together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Nope, that's the wrong thing. Have a wonderful day. <coughs> How to get out of this chair. There we go. There we go. Father Paul Ring, Christ is in our midst. He is and always will be. God bless.
Bye now.